Well, as we approach the topic of heaven, I'm sure we have lots and lots of questions. In fact, the very last sermon in the series, we're going to do a kind of question and answer time. But first, we want to establish a good, healthy foundation. And in order to do that, we have to kind of rein it in a little bit. We have to give ourselves a little bit of restriction as we approach the topic of heaven. Otherwise, the temptation is just to let our imaginations run wild. But instead, we're going to restrict ourselves to the framework of the Bible and what the Bible tells us about the topic of heaven. It's kind of like an artist looking at a canvas. The artist can look at the canvas and become very frustrated with the bounds of the canvas. Or the artist can say, I'm going to create something beautiful. I'm going to be creative within those boundaries of the canvas. And so we want to create a picture of heaven, but within the boundaries of scripture. It's one of the reasons why I'm often very cautious about people who report near-death experiences. People who go uh, after death and claim that they have come back and have a very clear picture of heaven. Especially be cautious about people who would claim to have an authority that goes above and beyond Scripture, or even insights into heaven that contradicts Scripture. And so that's going to be our framework, is what does the Bible really tell us? What does the Bible point us to in relation to heaven? So last week, we looked at the idea of where is heaven? And the simple answer is this, with Jesus. I know that doesn't satisfy all of our inquiries and all of our questions, but that's the bottom line that we're given in Scripture. What happens to believers when they die before the resurrection? Well, Paul makes it very clear that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And that's an important part. And he gives us another image. He says that those who die now, who are believers in Christ, they fall asleep in the Lord. And that's a real part of what we have. And so Jesus even gives us this image of the Father's house. It's kind of a waiting time, waiting in anticipation of the resurrection and the final chapter, the final place that we might call heaven. And in fact, post-resurrection, we discover this. After the resurrection, we find a renewed heaven and a renewed earth coming back together in one glorious whole. God's space and our purified space united as one glorious whole. And that's a wonderful thing that we have a promise of in the scripture. So heaven is the realm of God coming to earth in that final sense. But either way, whether it's now or whether it's in the final sense, heaven is with Jesus. And that's what I want us to hold on to. And so we need to reorient our thinking a little bit from a spatial perspective about heaven to a relational perspective about heaven. And that will be a great foundation for us to work on. Well, today, the question is, what is heaven like? What can we expect? What can we anticipate when we begin to anticipate heaven? Is it streets of gold? Is it pearly gates? My mom wants a, a flying horse. She loves horses, but she hates the bumpy ride. Do we, do we get to choose? Do we get to dream up our wildest imagination for heaven? Well, I think as we read through the images that we find in books like Revelation and other parts of the scripture, we have to be really careful because the images are meant to convey the value and the glory and the beauty of heaven. It's as if Paul and John in particular catch a glimpse of heaven, but then simply don't know how to describe it. It's like when you go on a wonderful holiday and you come back and you try and tell people about it and they're just not interested. They just can't comprehend your experience. And so Paul and John, they grab a hold of these images that we know and are familiar with, images of beauty, images of value, and they use those images to describe heaven. Hank Hanegraaff, he has this to say about that. He says, the language of scripture is heavenly condescension to our earthly inadequacies. There's a joke I think Bill Buzan told me about a man who was on his deathbed. A man that had worked all of his life and had built a, a lot of wealth, but he was very sad on his deathbed because he couldn't take any of it with him. And so he made a deal with God. He said, God, I just want to take one suitcase of my wealth. And God said, fine, we'll make that arrangement. 
And so when the man was buried, he had instructions that a bunch of gold, gold bars would be put in the suitcase and buried with him. And so the man gets to the gates of heaven. St. Peter comes out and says, wait a minute, you can't bring that in? And the man says, well, I have an arrangement to bring just one suitcase of my wealth. And so St. Peter said, okay, fine. Let me see what's in it. He opens it up and is absolutely astonished. And he looks up and he says to the man, you brought pavement? Do you get the idea? The streets are paved with gold. It means that, that it's just so glorious that they're even using gold for pavement. And it's an amazing thing for us to begin to understand these images and these pictures. It's the same way that John describes Jesus in Revelation chapter 1. He describes Jesus as having beautiful, pure white hair and fiery eyes and, and glowing bronze feet. We don't need to go out now and paint Jesus in that way. Uh, John was trying to give us an image of the value and the beauty and the power and the permanence of Jesus. And he does the same way with these descriptions of the life that is to come. So, how then do we know what heaven is like? So what clue do we have about the life that is to come? Well, the biggest clue we have in the New Testament is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this is very important to understand the resurrected body of Jesus so that we can catch a glimpse of what heaven is going to be like for us. In fact, in the New Testament, there's not a lot of talk about going to heaven, but there's a lot of conversation about the hope of the resurrection. Well, why is that? Well, it's because not very many people caught a glimpse of heaven like Paul did or like John did. But many, many hundreds of reliable witnesses actually saw Jesus after the resurrection. So that was their hope. And so we need to shift our thinking again just a little bit. Instead of talking about gold and pearls, we need to talk more about the resurrection of Jesus as being the hope of heaven. That's what we need to focus on. That's what it tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. We're out here at Mark and Katie Banham's place in order to film this in the early morning of Friday. And uh, looking around me, all around there's farmer's fields. And this idea of first fruits goes all through the Old Testament, and it's a farming analogy. The idea is that the farmer sows the field and prays for the rain and the, the sun to grow the crop. But then when the first fruits of that grain or that crop are grown, what God called for them to do in the Old Testament is to harvest it, but not to eat it, instead to offer it up to God. And that was an act of faith. Because what if the rest of the harvest didn't come in? What if the rest of the fruit didn't produce? Then you, you were done. And so this idea of an act of faith being the first fruits of the harvest. Well, Paul says that Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. In other words, Jesus isn't the only one that's going to be resurrected. There's a whole harvest coming and it's a harvest by faith. And that's what we look forward to. We want to be part of that harvest of the resurrection. First John chapter three and verse two says this. Now we are children of God and what we will be has not yet been made known. We don't know entirely, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So what does that tell us? Well, Paul in the passage that was read for us gives us a wonderful metaphor. Paul was a tent maker. And so he turns to tents in order to tell us about the life that is now and the life that is to come. And he says, this present body that we're in, it's, it's like a tent. It's it's temporary. It's vulnerable to the wind and to the elements, to the rain, to even creatures. And it wears out. You ever feel that about the tent of this body? It's just kind of wearing out. That's what Paul says about the life that is now. But he says the future life, the life that is after the resurrection, the resurrected body, that's actually the permanent home. 
That's the secure dwelling. That's the permanent structure that is enduring. That's what we have to look forward to. I think so often we put all our energy into a tent and we have to respect the tent, but we have a future dwelling that is permanent. That is the resurrected body that is to come. So what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that in heaven, in the life that is to come, there is a continuation. It's not a different person that we're resurrected into. It is the same body, but a resurrected body. And there is a continuity between this life and the life that is to come. That's what we find in Jesus. When Jesus was raised from the dead, apart from the walk along Emmaus Road, when he kind of hid himself from the people, people recognized Jesus. They recognized his scars. They ate with him. He enjoyed breakfast on the beach. They socialized with him. There is a continuity in relationship and there is a continuity of being even in his resurrected body. But it also tells us that there's going to be a transformation. And it's this transformation that's so important. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in the message, it says this. Some skeptic is sure to ask, show me how resurrection works. Give me a diagram. Draw me a picture. What does this resurrection body look like? If you look at this question closely, you realize how absurd it is. There are no diagrams for this kind of thing. We do not have a parallel. We do have a parallel experience in gardening. You plant a dead seed and soon there is a flourishing plant. There is no visual likeness between the seed and the plant. You could never guess what a tomato would look like by looking at a tomato seed. What we plant in the soil and what grows out of it doesn't look anything alike. The dead body that we bury in the ground and the resurrection body that comes from it will be dramatically different. There's going to be a transformation. Paul goes on to say, but let me tell you something wonderful, a mystery I'll probably never fully understand. We're not all going to die, but we are all going to be changed. You hear a blast to end all blasts from a trumpet, and in the time that you look up in the blink of your eyes, it's over. On signal from that trumpet from heaven, the dead will be up and out of their graves, beyond the reach of death, never to die again. At the same moment and in the same way, we'll all be changed. In the resurrection scheme of things, this has to happen. Everything perishable, kind of a temporary like the tent, will be taken off the shelves and re be replaced by the imperishable. This mortal replaced by the immortal. So there's two great analogies that Paul gives us, both the tent and the permanent house, but also the seed that is sown and the beautiful transformation of the plant that comes. There's continuity, but there's transformation as we anticipate the final resurrected state. But there's an important point here that we don't want to miss. In the end, Paul doesn't despise the tent. He's not a Gnostic. He's not looking to escape this body into the, some spiritual realm. He has great value for the tent, great value for the body. He was literally a tent maker. And this really comes out at the end of the passage. At the end of the passage, Paul reminds us about a judgment time. Now, I might be tempted to say, hey, wait a minute. I thought there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. What happened to no condemnation? But this is a little bit of a different kind of judgment. The word that Paul uses here is bima. And the word bima in Greek referred to a raised platform. And the raised platform is where officials would give public speeches. It's sometimes where judges would meet to de decide cases. But it was also a place in the forum where they would hand out awards. Now, Paul actually stood before the Bema in Corinth because he, he had to come up against some charges that were laid against him. Uh, but he might be referring more to this idea of rewards when he talks about the Bema. It's a place to announce and distribute commendations. And so we're not looking at condemnation here. We're looking at commendation. We're looking at the fact that it matters 
what we do with this tent. Even though we're waiting for and longing for the life that is to come in the permanent dwelling, it still matters what we do in this body, in this body that we're given and the life that we're given right now. 1 Corinthians 3 makes this clear. It says, if anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If, it has been, if what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it's burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. What an interesting image. And so at this kind of judgment of the saints, the judgment of these believers, those things that we invested in, the things that last, the things that are done from faith, hope, and love, those are the things that remain. All the other stuff will be burnt up, will be saved, but just as one escaping through the flames, it says. So these rewards are not about works because we are saved by grace but it is about our capacity to enjoy the life that is to come won't this create some jealousy if we see someone has more rewards than we do well the old puritans gave us an image they said imagine a bunch of jars or pots all of different heights and as you think about all of them you fill them all up with water and the reality is that even though they aren't all equally tall they are all equally full. And so they are filled to the capacity that we have. And so during this life, it's in a sense where we're building capacity for heaven. We're building our capacity by investing in the things that last. That's why Jesus says, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moss and, moth and rust destroy, but lay instead up treasures in heaven where nothing can be destroyed. And that's the focus that we're meant to have. So don't be like the guy who brought a, a suitcase full of gold bars. That's the image here. We're not meant to be like that. Instead, we're meant to invest in the things that remain, the things that last. We're meant to do something with this life we have now, even though it is temporary. So where is heaven? Well, it's with Jesus. And what is heaven like? Well, we will be like Jesus. That's the bottom line. That's the framework and the foundation that we are working on within the Bible. There's an old expression that says, someone is too heavenly minded for any earthly use. And I, I wanna say that's nonsense. In fact, if we understand where we're going to be spending in eternity, I think we'll have more motivation to do something important and value with the life that we have right now. And so we need to make a shift again from mansions and gold and from pearls. And we need to have a shift to something far greater, the resurrection body. Just as Jesus is the first fruits, we are meant to be the full harvest. So here's the question I wanna end this uh, session on, is this, are we investing our lives in the things that matter, the things that remain, the things that are based on faith, hope, and love? Well, may God give us the grace to lay up treasures in heaven, because where our treasure is, there our hearts will be also.